morning, everybody. Good morning to the inside. This warm sanctuary feels good today, doesn't it? We want to say good morning to everybody watching online this morning. Good morning to you. We get to do something really cool. Every time we gather, the Bible says his presence is there in the midst of us. That's a great thought. I want to begin with a picture of Jesus and start the day, start our morning, seeing him in his glory. We're going to read John's words in Revelation chapter 1 of what he saw when he looked at Jesus in his glory. And we're going to end our day in communion. So for those of you at home, just kind of setting it up for you, we're going to end this morning in communion together as a body of Christ. Our conversation in the middle is all about our great God, knowing him as he is, that tension of the transcendent, amazing hugeness of our God and his intimate, I'm right here with you. That's what we're going to look at today as we talk about the fear of the Lord and we talk about how we become fearless. But let's read this, I mean, let me read this to you, read it over you, then I'm going to pray and we're going to dive in to our praise and worship and giving God glory, acknowledging him for who he is. Amen? Amen. John says this, Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a long robe with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow, his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace. And his voice, whoa, his voice was like the roar of many waters. And in his right hand, he held the seven stars. And from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in full strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last, the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Jesus revealed is really what the book of Revelation is all about. But for us today, to let the Spirit of God take away whatever veil stands between us and the knowledge of God, us and his deep love for us. Amen? So would you join me in that prayer? Father, we come into your presence today with this desire to bring you praise, the kind of praise that you are due, the kind of honor that you are worthy of, to come and declare that you indeed are God, that you are our God, that you are our King to relish in the love that you have for us, to be undone by the radical reality of your grace and mercy in our life, that you know us and that you see us. Lord, today is about you and we, your people, being undone in the presence of our wonderful, beautiful, amazing God. So receive our praise today in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship. Hallelujah.
new song we just profess it God we're going to profess this faith Lord to you you are the God of our salvation every day God every day
Sing out this chorus with me together. This is our God. This is who He is. He loves us. This is our God. This is what He does. He saves us. He bore the cross, beat the grave. Let heaven and earth proclaim. This is our God, King Jesus. This is our God. This is our God. Salvation of our soul, our salvation that we can cry out to every single day, every new morning, the God of our salvation coming to our defense and our rescue. And so we respond in worship. So we respond in praise.
rest in that truth right now. The one who's conquered it all, the one who's gone before. Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. He's made his way. His word is trustworthy. We can find no life outside of him. God, would you cause our hearts and minds to be guarded by your presence and your peace, Lord, as we just surrender right now and just Step in even deeper trust in this moment. We are not enslaved to fear, to shame, any of those things, the tactics of the enemy. We just step into the courts of grace right now and take a deep breath. We celebrate the new mercies. We take repentance as a wonderful divine opportunity for restoration and that free exchange of love that you freely gave on the cross. Hallelujah, you're our God and our King. Yes, you are, yes, you are, yes, you are. You unravel
uh, just the youth here dismissed. Uh, I would just take a moment, greet those around you, uh, give a hug, give a high five. you're here today. Again, very warm welcome on this Sunday morning to you. Hope you had a moment to hug one another, encourage one another. If this is your first time, a very special welcome to you also. We look forward to getting to know you. Hopefully you saw our connection table slash welcome table outside on the plaza. It's a wonderful spot to get to know uh, any, any questions that you might have from here about how to get connected, how to get plugged in, who is this church, who are these people. Uh, it's a fabulous uh, place to stop out there on the plaza as you're filling up your coffee. But also, uh, you can fill out a card, like I said, to get connected, but um, we have a gift card for you for Starbucks. Uh, just a little welcome gift uh, from our Bridge family to you. So very special welcome this morning. Behind me, I'm just gonna highlight a couple things. We have a QR code that links you right to our website, thebridgerism.info. The way I remember it is where, where do I go to church and what do I need, information. So it's super easy, anything I forget or if during the week you're like, I forget the details of the announcement, you can go to that um, site anytime. You can even do your phone right now and be taken to the couple things that I'm gonna highlight this morning. First and foremost, our Bridge Builders group, our 55 plus and uh, are getting together this week. I'm so excited because our very own Dr. Tom Hicks is going to be walking through uh, the importance of our spiritual and physical heart health. Uh, I heard there's chocolate there. I hope it's dark chocolate because that justifies all medicinal reasons and happiness. But I do hear those treats. They're healthy treats. But uh, they will be gathering together this week. Again, go to the 
website for the details of time and place, and that is going to be uh, just an awesome time to connect together uh, for our 55-plus uh, group. Also coming up next Sunday, February the 12th, is our Impact Sunday. This is a time where we look back over the previous year, so we'll be looking over and celebrating uh, everything that God did in 2022. I have to remember, we're moving so fast these days. Uh, where we go through, we celebrate all the um, uh, incredible things that God did uh, within our church, through our church, as we impact our community around the globe. Uh, we'll celebrate together, <coughs> excuse me, celebrate that together, and then we'll look forward and vision cast of the things that God's bringing us into and inviting us into for 2023. So that is next Sunday. It's just during uh, our church service here, so not at a special time or anything like that. And then, finally... Um, uh, I don't remember, so let's look for the prompt. I'm so sorry, our bridge groups <laughs> again. <laughs> hey, if you ever feel God calling you to do announcements, come on over and talk to me. We'd love to have you go through the rotation. We're here. Get you all involved in your skills and God-given calling. So come on up. But bridge groups are starting up February 13th that week. Look online again. A lot of the ones that have been going are continuing on, and we have new bridge groups uh, that are um, opening up. So it's a perfect time to get into that smaller setting, intimate setting. We we're created to do life together. Small groups are a way to just experience life and the presence of God together. So those are just a couple of the highlights to, to um, bring your attention to. Again, utilize that website, thebridgersm.info, for any of the upcoming events. I am going to throw one more plug in. If you haven't signed up for marriage retreat, it wasn't in my lineup for today, but we only have a few spots left. Do swing by the connection table, and you do have, a, a, a few, like I said, a few more options, a few more uh, openings to join that that is coming up very quickly. Would you join me in prayer as we pray for our morning and, uh, tithes and offerings? God, we love you. We praise you. Thank you again, especially in this season where it feels uh, stressful and it feels heavy, God, as uh, just things around us and culture and life uh, and our finances feel turbulent. And God, you continue to be the strong tower that we can run to, the fortress that we can hide in. And Lord, thank you for the reminders throughout worship, Lord, that you, you've got us, that fears, we're no longer a slave to our fear, Lord, that you have come and you will make a way, you will be our provider, you hold us in the palm of your hand. And so God, as we trust you and giving our tithes and offerings, whether it's online or in the box in the back, God, take it, use it, further it for your kingdom, but also, God, give us a sense of your peace and your directing and your holding us in the midst of all of it. So we love you, we praise you, we give everything this morning to you, in Jesus' name, amen. I think I'm on now, sorry. Uh, sorry, guys. Welcome to everybody online, too. I wanted to say this earlier, but we are sending you hugs right through this video camera. We love you. We're glad that we get to do this morning with you as well. Can we all just, just give them a clap? Let them know we're here. we hear you. We love you guys. However we're joining today, we get to be family, and that's a pretty awesome thing. Psalm 112. Verses six to eight. For the righteous will never be moved. He will be remembered forever. He is not afraid of bad news. Stop right there for a minute. Come on. He is not afraid of bad news. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. His heart is steady. He will not be afraid until he looks in triumph on his adversaries. Can you imagine what it would be like for this to be true of you? Just put your name in that sentence. Jim is not afraid of bad news. His heart is firm. Julie is not afraid of bad news. Her heart is firm. 
trusting in the Lord. Bob is not afraid of bad news. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. Cindy is not afraid of bad news. Her heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. Budget cuts. A report about your teenager. Emergency meetings at work. Quarterly reviews. The closing bell from Wall Street. Spouse wanting to have a serious talk when we get home tonight. Economic reports. Doctor's report. Can you imagine what it would be like to be truly fearless in this world? I've been looking forward to this week of the series for a long time because of these verses right here. Initially, I intended to call this the promise of fearlessness, but as I studied and got a lot deeper into this scripture, which just kept opening up, I realized it's better to call it the process of fearlessness. It's appropriate to be a promise, it is a promise. This is the reality, this is reality. This is the reality of a life that has truly embraced knowing God. This is a process though to get to this place that it is the truth of your life. And we've talked about the, the provision of peace, Jesus saying, I'm leaving, but I'm leaving my peace with you. I know you're going to go through things that are going to terrify you. Don't worry. I'm giving you my peace. Not like the world gives. I, I'm going to give you something. It's going to last. It's going to be available to you. We talked about that first, and then we looked at David's life, and we looked at the problem of fear and the, the power of courage and certainly the pathway to victory. But tonight, today, this morning, we get to talk about this process the heart of this is this understanding of the fear of the Lord. And hopefully today we can do some justice to a conversation that has volumes and volumes and volumes written about it and verses and verses and verses throughout your scriptures talking about it. I love this verse. I love this idea. The words... Not afraid of bad news, like speak to my heart. Bam, like those make sense. That, you talk about practical Bible right there. Yeah, bad news. There's lots of news. Am I afraid of it or not? I think of Master Shifu for sure and, and Ugwe in Kung Fu Panda. And he's like, there is no bad or, it's just news. It is not good or bad. And he's like, well, this is what happened. He's like, that is bad news. <laughs> if you don't believe. And then it goes on. But I just, this understanding, like real, like news, like who knows what tomorrow holds? I mean, truly, none of us do. You go in for a routine, routine physical. And in the back of your mind is this conversation that you're having, like everybody else is having, of what might they find. Right? Especially as you get older, these things become more real. End of the year at work, and they're looking at how did we close the year and all that that's going to mean for this company. Whether it's bonuses that come or are lost, or it is jobs that are lost and budget cuts that are trimmed up. For many, our investments, the stock market, and watching that, Closing bell, how did we end? Another down day, another down market, another down month. The news. There is a way of living in this world. It is a promise, but it's a reality. It's a process to get to this place that you literally live so trusting in the Lord, so understanding of who he is, so understanding of who, how he thinks about you that you realize all these things that you can't control, you have no need to fear because the one thing you know is that God knows and God loves you and he's with you. And no matter, no matter what comes your way, that's not gonna change. 
There is also in our context, in our Western context, this is not the same in the church around the world. I just want you to understand, it is our context though. It is very possible to have grown up in the church a long time or just heard about and just kind of new to the faith. But to take our Western mold and put Christianity into it and come out with the gospel it has something to do with this. There is a God and he is here to serve me and make my life better. And so if I do the right things, if I follow the right rules, I should and can expect all good things. All good things, all good things. But the context of scripture and the context of Christianity that will make sense in the world today comes out of an understanding of the fear of the Lord. And here's the picture, I am here to serve him. He is not here to serve me. Everything we read about Psalm 112 is the overflow of a life that gets this at its core. I know my God. I know my God. I know him as he is, not as I want him to be. And that is what leads to this six, seven, and eight, these verses that say he is not afraid, she is not afraid. Their heart is firm, trusting the Lord because they know who God is. In this passage, Psalm 112, it's actually a companion psalm to Psalm 111. The two of them are, I, they're, they're companions to each other. They both have a special way that they're written out. They're kind of an acrostic form, not kind of, they are an acrostic form, 22 lines, the Hebrew alphabet. Each line begins with the first, with the, that letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And the first Psalm 111 is all about the great God, the great God of the Bible, our great God. It begins with praise the Lord, our great God. And then it talks about his works and his wonders and then Psalm 12, 112, continues the conversation. The same structure, the same. Some of the verses you'll even see, like chapter, verse 3 here and verse 3 there are very similar in the way that they're written. Is all about the great life of somebody who knows the great God. I want to talk about that. I, I have a structure to this message, just so you know, but... I just felt like this one just kept moving on us so much that it's this concept that I, is bigger than the linear that I wouldn't typically give you three points. Let me read all of Psalm 112 and then we'll kind of look at a few points in it or a few points this morning about the whole concept. Psalm 112 starts like this, says praise the Lord. Let's all say it together, ready, one, two, three. Praise the Lord. You know the other way of saying that in one word? Hallelujah. hallelujah. All right, that's the word actually. So let's say hallelujah together because it means praise the Lord and that's how it's read. One, two, three. Hallelujah. Now we're not saying it to each other. We're saying it to him. One more time but to him. One, two, three. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's how he starts. You have to hear that because these are written this way. They're written to be songs and hymns to be declared, to be sung out. So he says, hallelujah, blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments. His offspring will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. Light dawns in the darkness for the upright. He is gracious, merciful, and righteous. It is well with the man who deals generously and lends, who conducts his affairs with justice, for the righteous will never be moved. He will be remembered forever. He is not afraid of bad news. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. His heart is steady. He will not be afraid until he looks in triumph on his adversaries. He has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn is exalted and in honor. And in contrast, the wicked man sees it 
and is angry. He gnashes his teeth and he melts away. The desire of the wicked will perish. The fear of the Lord is what leads to fearlessness, ultimately. The fear of the Lord is what leads to fearlessness. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, he says, who greatly delights in his commandments. The fear of the Lord is a healthy fear for mankind. But it is not the kind of fear that we're used to talking about. What is the fear of the Lord? What is it like? Well, it has to do with this awe of God. Who he really is. Who is it that shakes the earth, thinks about me? The awe of God is the awareness of God. You are right here. You are with me. You see everything. My life is lived out right in front of you. I can hide nothing. You know my thoughts before they're, you know my words before I say them. You know everything. It's this awareness of God. And it's this acceptance of God's word. Hey, God, your word, you, you've said it, and I believe it, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live by it. Not just accepting it like, yeah, that is God's word. It is, this is God's word for me. In Psalm 111, he even goes on to say, every precept is, ever, is true, it's everlasting, it doesn't go anywhere. Everything that you have said and declared is always going to be true. Why? Because it's the very foundation upon which all of creation has been built. Your words don't change. They aren't culturally relevant or irrelevant, depending on the generation and what they had for breakfast. Your word stands. Even when men try to change it, it stands. It's, the, it's, it's what relationships are built on. It's what lives are built on. And when we walk in alignment with your word, when we walk according to your word, your precepts, because they are true. Not that they can be true. They are truth. Build a life that you read about in Psalm 112. The overflow of that life that we looked at is amazing. We all say, I want Psalm 112 as the story of my life. Am I right? You know, when I first encountered Psalm 112, when it like, got on my radar, maybe eight, nine, ten years ago, just reading in devotions, and as I was reading it, I finally, like, it just jumped out. Like, it stuck. And I looked at it, and I... I said, this is the life of my grandfather. It's the story of his life, Psalm 112. And we went to some event where he was being honored. He was given an honorary doctorate. This, he never went to high school, by the way. He never went to college. He was short. He was five foot four and a half, maybe five foot five on his best day before he started to shrink. Many of you knew him for many years. He's a big part of our church story, our church life, but he came from nothing, started little businesses here and there, went through the Great Depression, lost everything, started over again. Some businesses worked, some failed, but he just continued on. He helped plant churches, never as a pastor, never wanted to preach, just preached with his life. Never had a lot to say, had a few words at a time, that was about it. He loved everybody, gave him the shirt off his back, was willing to do whatever it took, whatever it took. That's just the way he was. And I looked now two generations later and I'm seeing Psalm 112 and I'm going, it is so true of his life. Not just with the household stuff, not just the generations, but Psalm 112 verse six, seven and eight. Not shaken, a heart that was steady, trusting the Lord. 
More stories that I can share with you about all of those things, but I, that's when I first got on my radar. And then I preached it at his funeral because, like, this was the story of his life. And then it's got this intimate connection with me now because I'm, like, constantly looking at it going, God, that's the life I want to live. And the more you dive into it, God says, great, if this is the life you want to be true of you, then this is what you've got to know, Psalm 111. Psalm 111, you've got to know me. The fear of the Lord is what brings about a life that is built like that. Proverbs 28.1, the wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are bold as a lion. Oswald Chambers says, the remarkable thing about fearing God is that when you fear God, you fear nothing else. I thought this would be interesting just to help you get your heart around the fear of the Lord. Isaiah chapter 11 speaks about the coming Messiah, Jesus, what he would do and the reign that would come. It talks about his millennial reign after that, but it says these words about Jesus. It shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, a branch from his roots shall bear fruit, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of the knowledge of the fear and the fear of the Lord, and his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. Isn't it so helpful to know Jesus walked in the fear of the Lord? So fear of the Lord had nothing to do with the fear of judgment. It's not this fear of God as in the sense of being judged by him, but it is this sense of I hate sin. Sin sucks. It's the opposite. It brings about the opposite of the life that God intended for humanity. Jesus walked in a life. He said, I only do what I see the Father doing. I live to please him. to please the Father. Everything about what Jesus did was for the will of the Father. What did you send me to do? What did you call me to? That is what I'm going to do with my life. He walked in the fear of the Lord. He was the example of what the fear of the Lord looks like. In case you wonder, what is the fear of the Lord? In Psalm 111, just the one before, like I said, it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom all those who practice it have a good understanding. So that's what leads to Psalm 112. The fear of the Lord flows out of knowing God. It's the beginning of wisdom. It flows from knowing God. And so in Psalm 111, verses 2 through 6, he talks about the amazing works of God, and he talks about, you know, this picture, this idea of creation and heavens and all of this, and he says those who are willing to ponder them, to sit on them, to, to, to just chew on it all, to, to look at the magnitude of God, who is omniscient? He means he knows everything. Who is all-powerful? He can do anything. There's nothing God cannot do. Who is omnipresent? who is everywhere at all times. This reality of God, when you stop and settle in on the nature of who God is, wow. It does something to you and to me. But Psalm 111 then goes on to talk about, and he feeds those who fear him. He's speaking about time in the wilderness when he gave them manna from heaven. And he speaks about remembering his covenant with mankind, his unconditional commitment to care about you and me when you and I can be such knuckleheads. And yet he doesn't give up on us. And in it we see this tension. And this is the tension of the entire Bible. It's the tension of our morning. This transcendent God who is so big I want to know you like that. Why? Because if I know you like that, nobody else looks frightening compared to you. Am I right? Yes. Nothing else looks big compared to you. J.I. Packard says, so 
We are cruel to ourselves if we try to live in the world without knowing about the God whose world it is and who runs it. He's talking about, you gotta know God, you gotta, you don't wanna just live in this world, you gotta know the one who made the world, who runs the world, the principles that the world is built on, him, you can know him. How long has it been since you've been wrecked by the glory of God? Honestly, just wrecked by it. I mean, undone, overwhelmed, like John, on your face before him. I fell as though dead, he said. Like, come on. How long has it been since, like, his glory has impacted you in such a way? Everything else seemed small, and he seemed just limitless and amazing. That's the transcendence of God and then this imminence of God that Psalm 111 speaks about. In Psalm 25, 14, he, there's a little one that says, the friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him. He makes known to them his covenant. It's a very simple picture, but the idea of God being your friend, this is the imminence. This is Jesus saying, come follow me, guys. Come on, let's do life together. We're going to sleep in the same house, under the same stars together. We're going to laugh about that last encounter with the Pharisees together. That he would be your friend. We would be super impressed if the senator of wherever called us up and said, I want to be your friend. We'd be so impressed if the president of the United States says, I want to be your friend. We'd be super impressed if somebody big, super wealthy said, I want to be your friend. And yet the God who owns everything, who made everything, who controls all things, who stands over all things, who made this universe says, and you can be my friend. How long has it been since that picture of his intimate love for you? The embrace of his love and grace. How long has it been since that has overwhelmed you? When was the last time? This is the imminence of God. You want to know God? You know him like this. funny, I uh, came across some tension words between C.S. Lewis and A.W. Tozer. Some of us know A.W. Tozer's famous statement, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us, which is so good for this conversation, right? What comes into your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. What a thought. But years before that, C.S. Lewis wrote something about a similar phrase, and he wrote this. I read a periodical the other day that the fundamental thing is how we think of, how we think of God. But God, by God himself, it is not. He's saying by God himself, it is not the truth. That's not the fundamental thing. It's how God thinks of us. It's not only more important, but infinitely more important. Indeed, how we think of him is of no importance except insofar as it relates to how he thinks of us. And I think these two men are just living the tension we're trying to talk about. Both are ridiculously amazing thoughts to ponder. Who God is and what he thinks of me. They're, they seem like, they, Father, it's so amazing. And we live in this tension of the lion and the lamb. Right? The lion who can roar and decimate armies and the lamb who says, I will give my life as a ransom for these people that I love. This is where the fear of the Lord flows from. Do you know him? How long has it been since you got wrecked by his love? the audacity of his grace. 
that he would call you and me a friend. And the fear of the Lord is a life surrounded or surrendered to glorifying God. This is, I think, our moment this morning. Our moment surrounds this reality. Because who knows how many years we have to undo of thinking about God and Christianity and religion in this moment right here. But this is the invitation. The fear of the Lord comes into view for us and we see who he is and the greatness of who he is. And instead of reading Psalm 112 as, uh, oh yeah, you're going to give me that kind of life? I'll sign up for this Christian thing. We read Psalm 12 in light of Psalm 111 and we realize the only way Psalm 112 is the reality of life is if we know Psalm, the God of Psalm 111. Where knowing him is the point of my life, following him, walking with him is the point, it's the greatest treasure we'll ever have in this life is to know God and to walk with him. Like that's the thing. And then all of a sudden we read the rest of scripture, especially in the New Testament, over and over and over again through Paul's words, because Paul got this, right? Paul got knocked off his donkey onto his keister by the glory of Jesus, blinded his eyes and turned his life completely around. And he wrote most of the New Testament, planted multiple churches all through Turkey, Greece. But God told him, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. And if our Christianity does not have at its roots a willingness to suffer for the name, no matter what comes our way, though he slay me, like Job said, yet will I trust him then we don't know the fear of the Lord. Then we got sold a very thin view of God that is not worth jack nothing. Exchange that real fast. For me, Job is my hero. I hated reading the book of Job. Just so you know. I hated it. I'd try to skip two parts, read the first three chapters and read the last three chapters and it was like this is the best part of Job. Everything in between was like rubbish. <laughs> but Job is my hero. Why would Job be a hero? Because Psalm 112 was Job. That was his life. This blessed life that came from fear of the Lord. His Generations, his family, his house, his wealth, his care, his generosity to the poor, his uprightness, his justice in living, his compassion for everyone around him, his love of God. Psalm 112, man, that was Job's life. And then Job's life takes this turn that makes no sense. God says, do you see my servant? And Satan goes, yeah, but take away his stuff and he'll curse you to, his fa to your face. And Job undergoes tremendous suffering, unspeakable things that you and I go, man. He, and he had no idea what was going on. And he's like, I wish these words like this confusion and trust mix that I have for God, this fear of the Lord, yet this ability to think I could somehow approach you and plead my case. Like Job is living the tension because he doesn't understand what's going on in his life. He's like, I wish my words were written down and they were written down. We still have them today. And now we learn the challenge of Job's day was they had no concept of evil. And the spiritual realm had no concept of a, a frail human man who could trust God so much that you could take everything from him and yet he won't break. He's my hero because the glory of God was the point of his life. 
My life is not my own. I've been bought at a price, Paul said. I was purchased. So we make it our aim to please him, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. The fear of the Lord speaks to my soul, and it reminds me I am here to serve him. He is not here to serve me, but serving him, everything comes from that. But that also includes the hard times where God gets the glory through my suffering, through my pain, through my challenges, by him not taking away this thorn in my flesh, like Paul said, by learning how weak I am and in my weakness, then he's strong. Because the point of my life is not to be blessed. I am blessed because I know him. And whatever blessing he gives me, I will give it out. But sometimes the blessing can even come through the pain. And praise God for those of you who have experienced the pain because you're some of the greatest blessings we'll ever know in our times of pain. Because of how you've learned God, how what you've heard from him, how he's met you, how he's walked with you. And all I'm saying this morning is fearlessness is possible. It is a process, but it comes out of the fear of the Lord, but the fear of the Lord takes our whole life. And I have so many verses I wrote down in my notes that I don't even get to read. But Matthew and Mark and Luke all record Jesus saying this, listen, if you're going to follow me, you've got to lay down your life and take up your cross and follow me. There's no way to be my disciple. You cannot be my disciple unless you're willing to lay your life down. This is the message of the fear of the Lord that says, I know who you are. I know who Jesus is. I know who my Redeemer is who will one day walk on this earth. I know who he is. And to him, I am the most important thing in the world. And at the same time, that's a ridiculous thing to say. He loves me. He's crazy about me. He has one intention. It's to do good only always in my life. So even in the challenge, even in the pain, in the sickness, in the hospital bed, even through the cancer, even through the loss of a child, even through grief, even through divorce, even through the hardest things in life, that hasn't changed. You are still with me. You still love me. And you are still writing the story. The fear of the Lord takes me through the hardest stuff. And if you're willing now to walk through whatever God's journey is for your life to bring glory to, the, to him, like Job, whatever it takes, God, that you would get the glory through my life. If you're committed in life to that end, then truly all things work together for good. And there's nothing left to fear. There's nothing left to fear. Would you stand with me? My sober question today for our church, even those of you at home, those of you outside, this is my sober question for us. Are you or have you, have you come to believe in a gospel that says God is here to bless me? As long as I do the right things, he's going to bless me period, or have you come to believe the truth in this ridiculous God who does love to bless you, but that your life is here to glorify him no matter what it takes, no matter what you go through? Where are you in this journey? Where are you on that spectrum? Because if you need to make the great surrender this morning, that's, that's what we get to do. God, 
I can't follow you. I cannot follow you until I lay down my life at the altar. Not my will, but yours be done. Until I go to the garden of Gethsemane with Jesus myself and I take my life and I lay it there in the garden and say, Father, not as I will, but as you will. I believe you. I believe your word. I believe your plan for good. No matter where it takes me and what it costs me, I'm laying it down for you. I'm going to invite Taylor up. He's going to lead us. We're going to take communion together now. And Taylor's going to walk us through that. But this communion is the response to this message today. Taylor? I love the, uh, the picture of the fear of the Lord. But a fear that is reverent, that is awestruck. Not a terror at a mean, angry God but an impassioned love for a benevolent king. One of the ways that we remember that benevolence is through the sacrament of communion as we, as we acknowledge the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And while normally we take this corporately all together, we're gonna do it a little bit differently this morning. And as we go into this next song, we want to take time to reflect on that gift, on that sacrifice. As we do that, feel free, sit, stand, sing, contemplate, whatever you need to do as you ponder the incredible majesty of this gift. As you reflect on the gift that you've been given. And then as an act of gratitude for that gift, feel free to take the bread and the juice as you feel ready. Lord, we are just grateful. We're grateful for what you've done. We're grateful for the gift that you've given us. Lord, no words can express that thanks. No song or sermon or work of art is sufficient to express our awe and our reverence and our love for you. And Lord, we, we just reflect on the love that you have for us, for the ways that you've met us. and for the ways that you wanna meet us in our humility as we choose to say yes to you. Thank you for what you've done for us and follow you all the days of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. 
I've got one response I've got just one move With my arms stretched wide I will worship you So I throw on my hands Praise you again and again So that I have is a heart Nothing else fit for a king Except for a heart-seeking Hallelujah 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 My heart Come on, my soul, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. You've got a lion inside those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Oh, come on, my soul, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. Got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Oh, come on, my soul. Don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. You got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Jesus, everything is yours and the fullness thereof. So what can I bring each day? Jesus, I can bring my surrendered heart. And Lord Jesus, I thank you for your grace and mercy that when I fail to submit all of it, that your kindness comes and moves me back closer to your heart and says, there's a better way, son. Daughter, I have a better way. I love you so much. I want you to experience this in me. I have this freedom for you. What you think you might lose, you have so much more to gain. And you're not losing at all. You're actually receiving from Jesus. Amen? Whew. What an incredible king we serve. And everything that was made was made in and through Jesus.
one who would humble himself to a cross that we could come in a moment like this with communion and just pour out our praise to him and that as broken as we are, he would receive it and it would bring glory to him and bring joy to his heart. Isn't that marvelous? That's a marvelous truth. Carry that truth with you. Carry that peace of God within you. And especially when the bad news comes, remember who your king is before you start thinking about the things coming your way. Listen, we have something really special too. You know this, we've had the 24 hours of prayer that we had on Friday, so, so powerful. And I feel like we're just in that momentum of the Holy Spirit and what he wants to do. And we have the youth outside, they have prayer booths waiting for you. So if you'd like to have them pray over you for your life, for your week, for your next moves, your next decisions, they wanna stand with you. And so I, I urge you to go out there and just let them bless you and believe for you and send you out in that way, amen? Amen, God bless you, have a powerful week in the presence of your King.